In this session, we're going to see what the Bible says about living a sexually pure life. God is the creator of mankind and, as such, has placed certain parameters upon our behaviour. When these parameters are adhered to, we can then expect to live in God's blessing and provision. In the Garden of Eden, God placed only one behavioural restriction that we read about upon Adam and Eve. We read that they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told that in the day that they ate of that tree, they would surely die. We read that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. What we see is a prohibition on behaviour and a serious consequence if they failed, that consequence being death. After their subsequent disobedience to God and the resultant fall, they were expelled from Eden and now had to live by the sweat of their brow. Where everything had been provided previously for them, they now had to provide for themselves through hard work. Genesis 3, 17 to 19 and Genesis 3, verse 24. Thus we see the shaky beginnings of the human race, man and woman together disobeying God and suffering the consequences of their actions. Because of this fall, God has subsequently had to put into place restrictions upon the behaviour of all mankind and especially their relationships with one another. These restrictions, just like the one given in Eden, are for our mutual benefit and cover very special or specific social, relational and sexual aspects of our behaviour towards one another. You see, man was created in the image of God. The scripture tells us that God created man and woman in his likeness, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. He created them male and female, Genesis 2, 18 to 25. The idea of sexuality was God's from the very beginning because they were to multiply and fill the earth, Genesis 1, 28. With the fall, sin and death entered the earth with dire consequences for the sexual nature of both man and woman. Sex which was originally confined to the context of a committed, lifelong relationship of one man with one woman, now became subject to man's aberrant behaviour. It doesn't take long in the history of mankind for us to read about multiple wives being taken. Lamech, for example, in Genesis 4:19. God destroying the earth because of man's wickedness in Genesis chapters 6 and 7. The judgment of two towns, Sodom and Gomorrah, because their inhabitants were involved in homosexual behaviour. We read that in Genesis 19 verses 4, 5, 12, 13, 23 and 24. Quickly after we see concubinage, in Genesis 16, 1 to 6, we see rape in Genesis 34, verses 1 and 2. We see children being born through wrong liaisons, prostitution and incest, for instance, in Genesis 38, 11 to 30. And we see targeted, seductive behaviour in Genesis 39, 7 to 12. And you may remember the story there of Joseph and his master's wife who, who constantly pursued Joseph to come lie with me or to have sex with her. None of these things reflect God's original intention for mankind or for his sexuality. All of this recorded for us in the book called Beginnings. We can assume, therefore, that man did not get off to the best of starts. The, effect, the fall affected all of man's relationships, including his sexuality. This was a far cry from what God had intended in creation. Originally, 
Sex was to reflect the creativity of a holy God who expected that his holiness would be perpetuated in the earth through human beings who were connected relationally to him, living pure lives. Once that relationship was broken, there was pro propensity for the creative act also to become broken. The image was now marred and the creative act marred as man began to explore his sexuality outside of God's will for his sexual expression. I want to uh, think for a moment or two and talk for a moment about the expression of unity. Sexuality within the bonds of marriage has a foundational place within society. Before societies officially recorded marriages, there was always some public expression within the culture or the people group that determined who was married to whom. Marriage, therefore, was often a very public affair associated with the rituals determined and adhered to by a particular cultus. So each people group of people had different ways, different methods of expressing to the common community that a couple were now man and wife. You know, in Bible days, it was no different. And I want to read to you Matthew 25, 1 to 13 from the Bible. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while I went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In that story about the virgins, what we see is... Jesus has used some elemental things that are very common to the day that were practiced in the Jewish cultus in relation to marriage. An engaged woman was considered as a married woman when it came to sexual purity. In other words, a sexual liaison with another man before she was married was biblically considered to be as though she had committed adultery. In many instances, the offending parties were to be put to death depending on the circumstances. Jesus did not judge the adulterous woman taken in the very act of adultery. On the other hand, nor did he justify the act. He simply told her to go and sin no more in Matthew 3, 8 to 11. Adultery had physical and bad health implications for those who indulged in this kind of behaviour. You may read Proverbs 7, 1 to 23 in that regard. If a woman had been raped, that was a different matter. She was considered to be innocent. In Genesis 2, 23 to 25, we read the following statement. This is, how, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The above verses are not so much concerned about the act of sex, but of the unity that is to be found within a marriage. 
The woman came out of the man. She is of the man, of his substance and of his nature, that is, flesh and bones, though different. The word translated one here in the Hebrew means a plurality in unity of purpose. It's the word echod. It is the same word that we read in the saying of the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's not one I mean in singular, that is one in plurality of unity of purpose. So it is with a married couple. In marriage, whilst individually different, they become one in the purposes of God. That unity is to be protected at all costs. It is important for the protection of the woman as much as it is for the children. For children, it also provides cues for them to understand how to relate to others, both socially and within their own boy-girl relationships growing up and for later life. It helps prepare them for marriage. Marital unity also provides an additional mechanism for a person's faith to be explored and grow along with their partner's faith. The faith in turn is imparted to their children along with the moral implications associated with a dedication to that unity. The fabric of that unity and its associated morality is what today has been under attack by various anti-church and anti-Christian organisations, not to mention the media of films, books, television, magazine, magazines, pornographic literature, which is available both online and off. Today, that has ongoing social, economic, relational and legal implications that is destroying the very fabric of marital unity and our society as well. So then why sexual purity? It would be a simple thing to say because God demands it. God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone and provided a person for him. He knew what Adam desired and what was required. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 18 and 20. You see, we were never created to be alone. We function better in unity and in fellowship with one another. God intended for the marital relationship to be a lifelong committed one. Hence, when the Pharisees questioned Jesus on divorce and the teachings of Moses, he said, what God has joined together, let not man separate, in Matthew 19, 6. It says this, ye shall not commit adultery. He then goes on and says, Moses permitted divorce, but in the beginning it was not so. Divorce breaks the unity of the marriage, but as we read on, so does immorality or unfaithfulness. Verse 9 of Matthew 19. Immorality, what immorality does is it breaks the marriage contract. It breaks trust, which is foundational to the growth and maintenance of all relationships, whether that's marital, whether that's in business, you know, it covers everything. We need to be sexually pure in the face of a society that endorses both adultery and premarital sex as normative. Fornication, which biblically covers both premarital sex and other aberrant forms of sexual behaviour, is forbidden by God. There is good reason for this. Sex within marriage is the result of a committed relationship that is not just for a couple's enjoyment, but also for procreation. Without the commitment of marriage, sex then becomes the sole driving force of a relationship and singularly revolves around a person's self-gratification. The focus then is on self and not the other person as far as the development of a relationship is concerned. As such then, the pursuit of sex ultimately becomes destructive. 
multiple partners often become the behavioural norm and may give rise to all sorts of STDs, that's sexually transmitted diseases, that can in certain circumstances render a woman infertile, not to mention other venereal diseases that have long-term health effects upon children and adults alike. So why should we flee sexual sin? Well, sexual sin is abhorrent to God and it is something which God does judge. Marriage is honour among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Hebrews 13 verse 4. We know that all judgment has been given over to Jesus, but here we see that there is one category of sin that is dealt with by God alone, so we must assume that it is therefore very serious. The reason for this is that our bodies are meant to be sanctified, that is made holy, in service to God. Sexual sin violates the sacredness of our own bodies. Our bodies are meant to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, as we read in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 12 to 20. We discover the following. Paul states that he will not allow his body to be brought under the control of any external influence. That is, he practices self-control, and so should we. That's verse 12. Now the body, verse 13 says, is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Therefore, my body does not belong to me, it belongs to God. This requires a paradigm shift in the thinking of most people today because we are all so body image focused. Verse 15 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. You see, when a Christian person sins sexually, he actually joins himself and therefore Christ to that other person? Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Verse 16. You see, there is a unity expressed here that very few people realize. There is an adoption of the things that pertain to the other person's life. This covers the emotional, the soulish and spiritual side of the other individual. Spirits, as we know, can transfer from one person to another. This can have an enormous bearing on the way a person thinks and behaves. Illicit sexual partnering can leave a permanent scar upon an individual just not physically, but spiritually and emotionally as well. This is borne out by the next verse. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Verse 17. You see, joining with a harlot makes a person one spirit with her. This is the implication. If most people who were unfaithful to their partners thought this through, then I am sure that those visiting prostitutes or, sec or seeking sexual dalliances outside of marriage would not do so. Being joined to another can also produce changes in a person's personality. I have witnessed this in people. So verse 18 tells us to flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Here, as we see, a person sins against their own body. They also sin against God, in whose image they have been created, and against their fellow man, who has also been created in the image of God. It can't get much worse than that. Or do you not know, verse 19 says of this passage, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. As Christians, 
God dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. We are born of His Spirit, born from above, and are to be led by that Spirit in us. We are a vessel for God's expression in the truth. In sexual sin mars the vessel and its God-given direction and future, hence the exhortation to flee sexual sin. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, verse 20 says. Every part of us belongs to God because we've been redeemed by his blood and consequently belong to him. With sexual sin, every part of us is involved, body, soul and spirit, just not the body. Well, how about other sexual behaviours? You see, it's just not fornication and adultery. Uh, we have a number of passages of scripture that uh, we should look at. You know, Exodus 20, 14, of course, says you shall not commit adultery. But passages like Leviticus 20, verse 10, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery and his name, neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to, de to death. See, relationship is broken, whichever way you look at that. Other passages you may read, Galatians 5.19, Colossians 3.5. You see, the scripture forbids that there are also many different forms of sexual behavior forbidden by God. We need to understand that. So what are these other relationship or other forms of sexual behavior that are forbidden? Bestiality, having sex with an animal. Leviticus 18, uh, 23. Why don't we just read a passage here that may be of help to you. The scripture says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. You shall not mate with any animal to defile yourself with it. Nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it, it is perversion. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it. And the land vomits out its inhabitants. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land was defiled. Covers a lot, doesn't it? Sodomy, including lesbianism, all homosexual behaviour is denounced by God. Both bestiality and homosexual sexual behaviour, as I've read to you. And what we also see in that passage is this, that it brings a curse upon the land. Incest is another thing that brings a curse upon the land. And we read that in Leviticus 18, 6 and 9, and Leviticus 20, verse 12 prostitution, both males and females offering sexual favours for payment. In Leviticus 19, 29, it says this, Do not prostitute your daughter, nor cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry, and the land become full of wickedness. You see, the ancient Canaanites, those who possessed the land before Israel did, had temple prostitutes as a part of their religious practices. This was one of the reasons that God had them expelled from the land in Leviticus 18, 25, 27 and 28. Temple prostitution was common among many of the Eastern religious cults prior to and subsequent to the time of Jesus. So I want to talk a little now about maintaining your purity. 
But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. 1 Corinthians 7, 8 and 9. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them to remain even as I am. That's Paul speaking. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. It's good to emphasize that particular passage of Scripture because God has ordained marriage and he's ordained it for a specific purpose. And that is that the sexual drive that a male has and a female, that they might be fulfilled within the context of that which God blesses. As we see, marriage maintains both our physical and our spirit spiritual purity. But what about the interim? There is a process that leads to marriage. So what guidelines are appropriate to a couple as they progress towards that occasion? And I'm speaking here within the Western context. Here are some helpful suggestions for young Christians. Number one, don't spend too much time together alone. Number two, as much as is possible, find others to share activities with. Three, as soon as you are aware of your mutual attraction, share that with your church leadership. Four, find an older married couple who have a successful marriage to share your developing relationship with. Make yourselves accountable to them. Five, share your spiritual dreams and hopes together. Six, commit your relationship to prayer, individually and together, regularly praying for the other person. Seven, ensure that your growing relationship does not impact negatively upon church attendance. Some people having found a partner within the context of church just got so involved in their relationship that number one, they forget where they had found that that relationship and then they forget to build on it within the um, church context. Next, ask the question, is this relationship drawing us closer to Jesus? A good, healthy, growing spiritual relationship is the hallmark of a God, good God-called future relationship. Always remember that the person you are courting is a sister or brother in Christ. As such, Treat them with the respect that you would offer to any other member of Christ's body. If you feel that the courtship has no future, be honest with the other person, telling them as soon as possible. Do not blame or disparage the other person and definitely do not break the friendship by a text message or by Facebook status. Don't be a coward. Do not indulge in any behaviour privately that you would be publicly ashamed of. So God bless you and I really hope that you have found some benefit uh, out of this uh, session on sexual purity.